All right, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, I just want to, Joy, can you see me on the iPad? OK, perfect. <laughs> cool. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight for our first um, speaker of our spring speaker series. We're really excited. We also want to give a big thank you to Walla Walla University for allowing us to use this space. Um, so I do want to let everyone know that while we're here in person, we do also have a virtual audience attending with us as well. So just bear with us as we attempt all of this for the first time. Um, but we're really excited to tune in with virtual people as well. Um, really quick, I do want to do a little sound check and make sure that our virtual audience can hear us. So if people in the virtual audience, if you can hear us, please go ahead and type into the chat. We'll see. We're good. Cool. Also, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Haley. I'm an AmeriCorps interpretive naturalist here at Deception Pass State Park. Um, so basically, I get to help work with our education programs and help our visitors here build connections to our um, cultural, historical, and natural resources. Uh, at Deception Pass. We also have Joy Kaczorowski back here with us. She's our interpretive specialist helping with our tech today. So if anything, well, if anything, we have any problems, Joy will keep an eye on the chat. Um, for presentation, it's going to be about 45 to 55 minutes today. Um, and we'll leave some time at the end for Q&A. So please, if you have questions, hold on to them till the end. And for our virtual audience, we just ask that you type them into the chat and Joy will be able to read them out loud to us at the end of the presentation. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead. I'll introduce our speaker for tonight. Joining us tonight is Dr. Cindy R. Elliser, the research director and founder of Pacific Mammal Research. Dr. Elliser received her PhD in integrative biology from Florida Atlantic, Florida Atlantic University and spent 10 years working with Dr. Denise Herzing in the Wild Dolphin Project, studying the Atlantic spotted and bottlenose dolphins in the Bahamas. In 2014, Dr. Elliser moved to the Pacific Northwest and founded Pacific Mammal Research to study marine mammals in the Salish Sea, particularly harbor porpoises and harbor seals. She is the author of numerous papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals and, is presented, and has presented at international scientific conferences. Dr. Elliser also teaches biology and other related courses as an associate professor at Skagit Valley College. So join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Cindy Elliser. Make sure everybody can still hear me down there. Make sure it doesn't fall off. All right. Whoop. Okay, let me go this way so I don't knock over the camera. Okay. If I stand here, Joy, can they see? Oh, that's right. I forgot. Just kidding. Oh, do I have a little foot popper? <gasps> I, mean, I thought I had to be next to the to the computer, but I don't. So this should be up and down. Click down. There it goes. <laughs> so cool. OK, I love clickers. But right. well, thank you very much for coming and uh, coming to learn about harbor porpoises, our, our little unknown heroes here in the Salish Sea that hopefully I will get you to love by the end of the presentation. Um, so I came from Florida where I got to spend 10 years swimming with dolphins in the Bahamas. I don't really get much sympathy for that, I understand. Um, but it was a, a wonderful experience uh, getting to do that. But we came out here to um, have a different uh, ecosystem and really fell in love with the harbor porpoises out here. Uh, and so this is what I'm going to be talking about with you today. So like I said, we, I do do research on harbor seals. But we're not going to talk about them today. <laughs> so my the first thing many people ask is what is a porpoise in the first place? And I'm very glad you asked. Thank you. So porpoises are different from dolphins. Um, they have 
um, they're in this, they're different, they're in different families taxonomically. So they're, they're all cetaceans, which is a whale, a dolphin, or a porpoise. But uh, porpoises are smaller generally, and than dolphins. And the main thing that you're going to tell the difference is when you see it in the water, the porpoises will have a triangular dorsal fin, and the dolphins will have a more falcate or more curved dorsal fin. And the one that I'm giving here as a reference is the Pacific white-sided dolphin, which is the only other small dolphin we have here up in the Salish Sea. The other thing is if you get to see their face, which is adorable, the porpoises have a blunt face, whereas the, uh, the, the dolphins have a, a beak or a rostrum, so their mouth comes out. Um, and the Pacific white-sideds have less of a beak than other species. If you think of the bottlenose dolphin, that's the most obvious you know, bottlenose. Uh, but all porpoises have the blunt face. Most dolphin species have a, uh, a beak. Of course, the orca, which is the largest of the dolphin species, is one of the exceptions that does not. There's always exceptions to rules in biology. I tell my students that all the time. The other thing is if you ever got to see their teeth, which you probably won't, but if you did, the porpoises have spade-shaped teeth and the dolphins have cone-shaped teeth. Um, and porpoises are really small, and I never knew really how small. I figured their teeth were small, and then I got, I actually got to see a tooth for the first time, and it's literally like, like that. It's like just a couple millimeters, very, very tiny. It's quite impressive. The other thing is that there's a difference in behavior. So, and we don't know a lot about porpoise behavior at this point, which I'll talk more about. But in general, dolphins will bow ride. They'll wake ride. They love to uh, lots of times jump around in the water. Um, they're much more gregarious in larger groups and uh, seem to play more at the surface. Porpoises are more like, I'm going to stick over here and you don't, don't even look at me, I'm over here. <laughs> um, so they're much more shy, a little bit more shy, um, evasive to some degree in um, their behavior. So it makes them a little bit trickier. But those are the main differences between the porpoise and the dolphin. So here in the Salish Sea, which is one of the most beautiful places in the world, um, people like to ask that you left paradise in Florida. And I was like, oh no, this is paradise here. So it is such a beautiful area here. And the Salish Sea is all the waters of the, uh, all the inland waters of Washington state and Canada. So everything from the Strait of Juan de Fuca, Southern Puget Sound, the Strait of Georgia, um, and all the tributaries that go in and out from uh, the mountains. So it's a very high biodiverse area, uh, lots of different species of fish and bird uh, and mammals, and of course, invertebrates like cockroaches and things like that. Well, that's not marine, but you know, invertebrates like cockroaches, which of course are going to take over the world after everybody else is gone. But uh, for here in the Salish Sea, the, the porpoises species that we have are the doll's porpoise and the harbor porpoise. And uh, the doll's porpoise oftentimes gets mistaken for a baby orca because of the black and white coloration that they have. Uh, but they are an, a, an actual porpoise species. Um, they have, at the, when they come to the surface, it's very flashy in the way that they zoom through the surface and the water splashes up along the side. And it gives them this characteristic rooster tail type splash. And a lot of times if they're, if they're going fast, all you see is the water splash, you barely see the animal. Whereas harbor porpoises are, again, just bloop out of the surface and that's it. Uh, so the main difference again is the black and white coloration. Um, the dorsal fin too on a, doll, on a doll's porpoise to me looks like it's put on backwards because it's slanting forward instead of slanting backwards. Another key indication. So this is a typical surfacing of a harbor porpoise. So keep in mind the that big splash that the doll's porpoise had and then you have this guy. Sometimes the dorsal fin barely comes out of the water. They are the second smallest cetacean in the world. They are the, uh, the only thing smaller is the vaquita, and the vaquita is a critically endangered animal in the Gulf of Mexico, I mean the Gulf of California. Um, and it is, there's only about 10 animals left as of last count. Um, so they are very, very endangered. Uh, the harbor porpoises are not, thank goodness, but they're all very small, uh, about five, five and a half feet, and about 150 pounds on average. Uh, so kind of like a, an adult, uh, average adult. Um, they, their average lifespan, uh, they live anywhere from eight to 25 years. We're not sure really how long they live. They can live up to 25 years. They do generally probably live quite a bit shorter time frames, probably more than the eight to 15 years range, um, compared to dolphin species that live at least 50 or more. 
So the, the big takeaway here is that they live at least half the life of a dolphin, if not a little bit less. So they like to say they live life in the fast lane. So in order, so the main thing for mammals and, and animals in general is to create more babies to create, you know, keep the population going. So if you die sooner, you're going to have to get started sooner. So they will start having babies at around three to four years of age and mothers can have um, calves every year or every other year, depending on the population. So they, they have to get going quickly. A little bit about just their, their the physical, what we know about them. Um, but I get asked a lot, well, why do we study harbor porpoises in the first place? Um, and beyond the fact that I think we should understand them because we should understand everything, as a biologist, that's kind of what I want to do. Uh, but there are other good reasons as to why we should understand more about these guys in the Sailor Sea. So they are what's called an indicator species. Most top predators are indicator species or sentinel species. And as it says, you can, it sounds, uh, they, they can be like a smoke alarm telling you that something's going on in the ecosystem below. If their population isn't doing very well, that means there's something that's happening in the ecosystem below them and might give us an indication of where to look. Um, it's hard to monitor everything. So if you can find one species that you can monitor that can tell you more about the health of the ecosystem, that's very helpful. And so they are good indicator species. Orcas are also good indicator species being top predators. But if we go back to that life history, orcas can live 50 to 100 years. They give birth um, every three to four or more years. Um, and porpoises give birth every, almost every year, live a shorter time frame. So the turnaround that you get with that kind of population uh, you're going to be able to see the changes sooner in a porpoise population than you are with the orcas. So in some ways they might be, I mean, don't tell the orca people, but some ways <laughs> harbor porpoises might be a little bit better indicator species uh, for that reason. Um, and so I love this. This is from the Sea Doc Society. Uh, this is a um, um, art by Devin Robinson <laughs> uh, that, of the ecosystem. Uh, and I just like to add in the porpoises right there. So. They're important in the whole with the seals and the orcas and uh, the salmon and everything. Uh, it's important to understand every part of the ecosystem in order to protect all of it. So the other thing is that we have a lot more transients or bigs killer whales that are coming into the Sailor Sea. More so, we see them more than we do the residents now. And the residents are the ones that eat fish and the transients or bigs are the ones that eat marine mammals. So they eat porpoises, they eat seals. Unfortunately, those are both my study animals, but that's okay. Uh, but they, it, in order to, the reason why they're here is because there's food. There are, porpoises are doing great, the seals are doing great, so the transients are gonna be coming in and are doing very well. And so this is the, you can see the picture here that is an orca and that is a porpoise. And I always like to say that as a biologist, it's a tough thing. You look at it and I go, oh, I feel bad for the porpoise and that's so sad, but that's so cool. It's so neat to see these animals in their natural, <laughs> in their ability to do what they do. Um, but it, if, so in order to keep the bigs killer whales, the, um, again, the transients are bigs, it's the same, same animal there, just different names for them. Uh, to keep them healthy, we have to keep their prey healthy, which is the harbor porpoise. So lots of reasons as to why we should, we should uh, understand them. So the Salish Sea history, there is in the 40s and 50s, harbor porpoises were everywhere. And if you were around um, in this area back then, they were, that's the animal that you saw from mostly when you went in the water. And they, we had few dolls porpoises. By this, in between the 70s and 90s, basically, they disappeared. So the harbor porpoises went down and the dolls came up. They, so you saw more dolls porpoises. And then uh, starting in the early 2000s, the harbor porpoises came back. Um, and now they are very plentiful with over 11,000 here in the US waters of the Salish Sea. Um, and we don't know why the decline in recovery occurred. It likely has to do with reducing, re reduction of gill netting, um, cleaning up the pollution in the, in, in the sound, uh, being more aware of our coastal development and how that affects these animals. So as we do those things, it's likely that those hurt the porpoise population. And as we've gotten better, they have allowed those animals to come back. So it's a great conservation story, right? These animals are doing well, and it's really nice to hear that when we're a lot of times talking about the southern residents where they're not doing well. So these guys are doing great, um, but we don't know 
why they went down or why they came back because nobody's really studied them very much. So even though they are really good animals to understand for the health of the ecosystem and all the other reasons that I mentioned, we know relatively unknown public population structure, abundance, distribution, movement patterns, ecology, and behavior. Pretty much everything. <laughs> Uh, because porpoises, they just haven't been the focus of much study uh, up until recently. So it's a it's an ideal candidate for a good study with there's lots of animals uh, and we know little about them to be able to uh, do a study with them. So the other reason why these animals have not been studied is because they're small and they're hard to see, but also are you going to notice the six foot tall dorsal fin coming at you? or the four inch dorsal fin that is coming at you, All right? So orcas have gotten more of the attention uh, for various good reasons, uh, but there are other marine mammals here in the Salish Sea uh, and they're also very important to understand. So we like, I, I'm the, the cheerleader of the underdog and the harbor porpoises are the underdog here in the Salish Sea. So um, that's what we came here to do. So we have these awesome animals, there are a lot of them, they're doing well. We wanna keep them doing well. So in order to do that, in order to make sure that another decline doesn't occur, we need to understand more about their population. So I came here again from Florida, uh, the warm sunny waters there to the cooler, slightly cooler waters here, and uh, came to Burroughs Pass, which is um, off of Washington Park and Fidalgo Island, if you uh, guys have ever been up there. This is a picture from the uh, overlook up top. Um, and we actually do our work a little bit closer to the water down a, on a trail a little bit farther down. Um, but it, they are there uh, year round. There was a group doing some research there uh, prior to when I came out here and kind of a little bit with an overlap there. Uh, and uh, they are there year round. It's a place where we could sit from land so we wouldn't have to worry about their interaction or um, evasiveness of boats and see what we could see with these animals. So, uh, in the Bahamas, I spent years uh, working up a catalog of, uh, with, my, with the Wild Dolphin Project of the animals that live there, continually adding new animals as they were born into the population using photo identification. Um, and so you take photographs of an individual and match it over time in different locations to understand more about their lives and their behavior. And so is citing, understanding the individuals in a population is vital to understanding a lot of things. So this is a quote from the Pinniped branding uh, on the West Coast, which is, they don't really brand anymore, but it, the idea stands for doing uh, natural photo identification as well. So by reciting an individual animal throughout their lives, we can learn about age specific survival, migratory movements, habitat use patterns, human interactions, resource conflicts, site fidelity, age at sexual maturity, reproductive success, and longevity. So pretty much everything that I said we didn't know, we can understand through the individuals. And so what we know about the orcas, the residents, the transients, all of those, why we know everything we know about them is because we know these individuals. We know the mothers, the daughters, the sons, the cousins, everything. So we know how all that interacts uh, and that's really, really important. So my question when I came out here was, can you do that with harbor porpoises? And um, most people laughed. <laughs> Rightfully so. Um, but we, you can use this on um, many different animals from orcas to the spotted dolphins and bottlenose dolphins in the Bahamas. Those are the pictures that I took out there. Um, the flukes of humpback whales, spotting patterns on cheetahs, uh, the ears of elephants. You can even do it on painted crayfish, apparently. Who knew? So anything that has a stable mark over time, you can uh, use. So again, the question was, do these harbor porpoises have stable marks that we could use. And so photo ID has been used on many species for a long time now, decades if not more, and, and depending on the species, but again, rarely attempted with these guys. Why? Because that's usually what you see. If you've been out in the water and seen porpoises, this is probably what you've seen. That's a, a fluke print where they've just dove, so you know that's where they were. You have no idea where they're gonna show up again. Um, again, they're really sleek in the water. They're, they don't like, they're not flashy. Um, and so it's, it's understandable why people have used, went to other animals to photo ID rather than these guys. The other thing is with photography, uh, with digital photography. Prior to this with film photography, it would be prohibitively expensive to try and do this. M many, many if not most of the pictures I take 
are not usable for photo ID. So if I did that and had to develop it every time, it would be really expensive. But I can take a thousand pictures and just delete them all now. So the age of digital photography has, has helped that. So the challenges, of course, are the behavior of the animals. There is a porpoise in that picture, a <laughs> little tiny itty bitty dot. So again, prox um, you know how close they are. They have really small dorsal fins and small bodies. Had to be even closer than, say, for an orca. So obviously, that's a beautiful picture, but not going to cut it for photo ID. So um, how much body they have under the, out of the water. So because their dorsal fins are so small, they don't have nicks and notches in the dorsal fin as much, which is what most small cetaceans are. You they use for photo ID, um, and so we use actually pigmentation on the side uh, of the animals. And so to get that pigmentation, they have to come up out of the water, which they don't always do. The most st uh, stressful and annoying thing about these guys is that they don't just say, "I'm going to come up here." Oh, I see where you are now. And now I'll come up again so you can take my picture. They don't do that. They like come up here and then 20, you know, you know, two minutes later, they're up over here going in the opposite direction. So erratic surfacings um, and then also lack of repeated surfacing. So again, if they come up a couple times in a row, more than likely can get their picture. But if they don't do that, it makes it more difficult. It's difficult to do photo ID with bottlenose in the Bahamas because they were a little bit more shy, but I never thought that I would be yearning for those days again. <laughs> These guys are a different level. Um, and then lighting. So because we're using pigmentation patterns on the side of the animal and scarring patterns, um, the lighting is, is more critical because you have to see those differences in the coloration patterns. So I've just explained a whole lot of reasons why you should not even try this on <laughs> harbor porpoises. But I said, let's do it anyway. Um, and the long story short is if you get a really big lens that is super helpful, and a place where they you can get pictures where they come close, you can identify harbor porpoises using photo ID. So we have over 80 individuals that we've identified um, in Burroughs Pass, and uh, a couple that we've we've matched a little bit farther out, but for the most part, um, using this the scars and uh, scars and lesions, the pigmentation patterns on the side of the animal, and we've also used their dorsal fin. Um, their shape. So the dorsal fin shapes, there's about five shapes that we've kind of identified, um, like hook tip versus pointy versus triangular, um, that most animals seem to fit into. So we can use that as a confirmation marking. So we use the pigmentation patterns and the scarring patterns primarily uh, as the main reason. Um, but because these are harder to ID, it's really good to have that extra layer of protection that you're doing the right one. So the, the dorsal fin shape really helps with that to be able to confirm that these are definitely the same animal. So we have eight categories in our matrix uh, for our ID work. Um, again, the pigmentation and the scars and lesions is the main thing. And then the dorsal fin notches, dorsal fin size and shape. Um, there's a few different uh, categories underneath that. Uh, there's three or four that uh, work with the dorsal fin shape and size. Um, so we put all those together to be able to make sure that we are identifying the individual. So it's not as easy as some other animals, but it's not as hard as we thought previously. So this is an uh, example, um, uh, a naturalist um, uh, illustrator did this for us. So you can see the different types of pigmentation that we have. So the line that goes from the, on the side of the animal, from the dark to the light, uh, either is very distinct um, sometimes it's kind of blotchy and kind of marbled effect uh, blending. More uniform where they don't really have that strong demarcation. And then some of them have these weird white patches, which we're not sure about. And then these are the dorsal fin shapes. So at first glance, you might look at a porpoise come up and go, well, that's the same, that they all look the same. But if you see, the, if you look at these dorsal fins, they are actually fairly different, which is really kind of an interesting thing that we've learned. So I want you to get to know a few of our porpoises that we've that we learned about over the years. Um, we have these up on our social media as well, so you can meet them. Um, Nip is one of the first ones that we identified, and uh, he, she, we don't know which, uh, has a big notch in the base of the dorsal fin, and then uh, line marks actually all down the peduncle, which is uh, from the base of the dorsal fin down to the tail. And that is, we're not positive, but it is most likely due to a propeller mark because the as the propeller goes, the animal goes through it, it goes slice, 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 slice as it hits. Um, but 
it's been doing fine. Uh, we've saw them for three years. We haven't seen them since 2017, so not sure if maybe one of the transients got got to them. But they can heal fairly well, uh, depending on the um, uh, the injury. So Comet is one that is why it shows why it's important to get new pictures as often as we can, hopefully every year, because scars and marks can change. The pigmentation patterns will generally say, stay the same unless they have a, a scar on them. But you can see in 2017, this is why um, they got their name, Comet, because it looked like a, I get, I get to name a lot of the animals, so it's whatever I think it looks like. So to me, it looks like a comet. Um, but in 2019, I almost was going through, and I'm like, I know this animal, but I can't, it's like, it, there's something there. And you can just barely see the white line now of where that line used to be. So in two years, it's healed quite well, and you can barely see it. But it is still there, and you can still match them. And then again, the, the dorsal fin shape. And then you can look at the, at the pigmentation here, too. You can see that they match. So uh, important to be able to get as many pictures as possible so we don't miss identifications. Jaws is one of our favorites. Uh, it's one of the first ones we named too. The the, this is the first time we really saw how strong that distinct lateral line can be. And so we thought it looked like a great white shark coloration. So it got the name Jaws. And we figured harbor porpoise can have a kind of a big, stronger name. Seems good. Uh, we think she's a female because we have seen her with a calf, but it is good to confirm that with you know, over multiple years to make sure that it wasn't some strange juvenile male that was hanging out with a calf for some reason. We've seen her almost every year since 2014. Piano uh, is, has become a, a favorite in the last few years. She showed up in 2017. She is a female. We've seen her with calves multiple years, so we're, we're, we're quite confident. Um, and she... Again, we've seen her just a few times in the last couple of weeks. So she's been coming to the past quite a bit. Um, pirate, this is because I think his dorsal fin looks like a pirate hat. It may be a Rorschach test kind of thing where, you know, what, what it looks like to me looks very different to you guys, but to me it looks like a pirate hat. Um, we think this one's a male because we've seen him since 2016 and he was likely an adult when we saw him. And if they start having babies at age three to four, from 2016 to now, we should have seen him with a baby if it was a female. So again, these multiple um, identifications over years can help us tell males and females, which you can't really otherwise tell unless you took them out of the water, which we don't do. Um, pointer, because it looks like the white mark looks like there's a, a finger pointing down. Uh, we, that, this one is a female as well. Now this one is exciting because the, we learned it was a female in a special way. Uh, during a mating attempt, and we'll talk about mating later, and I'll warn you now, it's a little bit graphic, uh, but we saw that the the uh, the attempt happened very, very close, actually, and when we looked at the pictures, we saw that she was the one that was the rec re receiving the male's attention, um, so we found out that she was a female that way. So again, another cool way to use photo ID. So this is, and now hopefully this will play, this is the video. So instead of, oh no, wait, actually this one isn't, just kidding. Oh, it doesn't like it now that I moved over here. That's funny. Let's see. So what we do, oh, I broke it. I like moved and now it doesn't like me. <laughs> I didn't touch anything. Uh -uh. There it goes. Maybe you just had to think. So uh, we take pictures, um, and most of the time we look this bundled up, um, but sometimes we get to roll up our pants and enjoy the sun. So we take the pictures of porpoises, and again, seals. We add it to all the environmental information that we collect and behavioral information, and that turns into the scientific papers that we produce that will, the aim of those is to get the information out there to the scientific community and also to those that make the policy decisions to understand and make the correct conservation decisions that are based on the biology and the uh, ecology of the animals. So now this is a short video that kind of covers all of the, let's see if it'll hopefully play. Uh, do I just click it? Oh, wait, there we go.
It was the same floor. Let's go back. So instead of me talking about it, I have a video that, that shows the kind of the first three years of, of data that we uh, collected and came for the figures. So lots of cool stuff, uh, and I'm going to show you even more cool stuff that we found out in the last few years after this one. So food, um, like as I said, they like to eat uh, for good reasons. They are attracted to those tidal stream habitats, which are all oftentimes uh, bring in uh, high productivity and there's lots of fish and they can actually sometimes use the 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 current and the rip to kind of make a wall and push the fish up against that kind of thing um, but the usage of this can vary between locations and even within locations so like we said sometimes they're, they're mainly out of the rip but they go into it when they need to eat that kind of thing um, but they need to eat so 
They need predictable food sources. They generally eat small prey of less than 30 centimeters or about 12 inches. And um, they, they have such a high metabolism and live in such cold waters that relative to other marine mammals and other cetaceans, they can't survive very long without food. So whereas these larger animals um, and whales uh, it can last for days or weeks without food, uh, these guys can starve in as little as three days if they're already not doing well. So they really need to know, like, I'm going to go here and my buffet is going to be here, right? So they have to go to these places that they know where the food is. So this is a very typical uh, surface chase. So they've come up to the surface and skimming across the top as they're chasing a fish. Um, this is one of my favorites. They hasn't broken the surface tension of the water yet. So he's actually, he or she is actually chasing a fish. And you can see, yeah, the fish is going to live another day. Huzzah, it survived, good for it. Just kidding. So the gulls are very good at taking the food from the porpoises. And um, at first I'm like, gosh, you, you're so mean gulls. But if you think about it, it's pretty smart. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately the gulls do take the fish from them sometimes. But we started noticing being out there and looking, right? And just being out watching this behavior, we started seeing them chasing things that were not small fish. And you can see in the bottom frame here, that's the tail stock of a very large fish, much longer, lar larger than the 30 centimeters. And so we were like, well, what are you guys doing? And then we got this picture. Uh, what are you guys trying to eat? Uh, remember five, five and a half feet, 150 pounds. These salmon that they are grabbing can be up to, you know, much, much like two feet more. I think that it's like 24 to 26 inches is kind of an average. Um, so like half the size of the porpoise. I don't think you can put that down your throat. I really don't. And that's kind of what we thought. Like, well, maybe they're just catching it for funsies. Who knows? Um, but they do actually apparently try to eat them or actually do eat them. So we were, we saw this and we're like, this is interesting. We started talking with our colleagues down in California. And, um, and we think this one, I believe, is the coho salmon that we uh, think is on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side are pictures from the Golden Gate Bridge, which we call a stationary drone, <laughs> that they get to just stand on the bridge and watch the porpoises uh, in uh, San Francisco Bay. And they have these ama amazing footage. And they see them doing the same thing, but with American shad. Now, American shad is an introduced species um, that was introduced uh, decades ago. And um, so we've seen, we don't, we haven't seen them in our area eat American shad, but we do know on the outer coast, the porpoises out there eat them along with the, um, the ones from, and hopefully this will just, this one doesn't have any sound, so it can just go, but it's, uh, so you can see it comes up. And what's interesting is the porpoise is holding it sideways like a dog bone before it dives down. And you'll notice this one is, is uh, does have a calf there following, so that's a female. So um, all cetaceans eat their food head first. So it's odd that they're having to handle the prey and then try to fix it in their mouth. Uh, and you can see here, this one slipped out. So he's got him here and he's like, no, and the fish got away. So it's a very different handling technique. So that was interesting. So we, we did document this, we wrote a paper on it, and then we were like, well, do they die from it? Do they, can they asphy asphyxiate from taking something that's too big? So this is, these two, next pictures are graphic. They are from a necropsy, but there's just one or two slides with them. So it turns out, yes, they do. So the, uh, particularly on American shad. And so we, we, we hooked up with our stranding network partners from uh, all along the coast, and we found 27 different cases that had not been put out in the literature yet. Uh, of porpoises asphyxiating on these American shad. Most of them happening, or at least a third of them happening since 2016. 87% um, of the cases that we could identify the fish was American shad. So this is obviously a, a problem for um, eat, to try to eat them sometimes. What's even more interesting is that over 90% of 92% were all female, the porpoises, and at least 83%, more likely close to 87%, were all re reproductively active females. So if you can imagine um, having to give birth and then lactate and sometimes being pregnant and lactating at the same time, if they have calves every year, that's a lot of energy. It takes over 100%, 105% greater energy intake for reproductively active females versus non. Um, so it might be that like, hey, if I eat one of these fish, I don't have to catch her 250 or 300 small fish. So it might be worth the risk, but 
The problem is if more, if this is happening more for females, you're losing the female and the calf in the process. And if that becomes a problem, it's a greater problem for the population overall. So it's important to understand that dynamic, and especially if it's an invasive species, what's happening with that. So what we also recently found is now after we see them starting to eat the salmon, we started seeing bald eagles try to do what the gulls are doing. So I guess when they were eating the small fish, it's like, I'm not going to bother stealing that. But oh, you're doing the work of, of trying to capture a salmon. I'm going to try to take that. So we're just getting a paper out on this now. Um, but you can see the um, eagle come down, grab the fish, come up with it. Um, we first observed this in 2019. Remember, the large fish that we started seeing was in 2017. So it took a little time. But this one was my favorite. Uh, I guess it got this last year in November. And so, you know, the porpoise is right there and he comes up with the fish. So he definitely absolutely stole that fish from that porpoise. And that makes me even sadder because like that's a lot of work <laughs> to 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 grab that. So again, being out there and observing these, the only reason why we know this is happening is because we're out there two to three times a week all year round um, to observe what these animals are doing and what's changing, right? This We've been out there seven years, have never seen this, and all of a sudden, you know, this is happening now. So they started taking salmon, which was not previously known to be any part of their diet. They do not eat that here, apparently. <laughs> At least they haven't, but that may be changing. Um, so we've also seen, uh, we're just being out there too, the one, the picture on the left, that's actually a seal inverted in the water. So that eagle tried to go down and steal a fish from the salmon, from the, um, well, probably a salmon, from the harbor seal. And uh, a volunteer sci uh, uh, um, citizen captured this. These were, uh, I think it was the T-68s, I think, uh, the transient pod that were eating a seal. And you can see the eagle come up with something in its talons. And so that was actually part of a seal. So they're learning to uh, take advantage of what these guys are doing. So how social these animals are is really debated. All my work in my master's and my dissertation was all in the social structure of those dolphins in the Bahamas. So it's really kind of what I, I really am interested in. I'm interested in everything, but particularly this. Um, but it's thought that they were asocial, that they don't have any social structure because they uh, don't have whistles like other uh, dolphin species do to communicate. They live in these small groups. They're not social. Well, I don't think that's true. And more and more information has been coming out showing that that's not true. Um, they have found cooperative hunting. So the drones that people have been able to use to look at these uh, animals in different locations have shown that the animals have roles and they stick to those roles. Like you're good at crawling over here and you're good at doing this job and they stick to those roles. So that cooperation involves some kind of communication and social um, interaction. There's a common dolphin that is communicating with harbor porpoises. So it's a lone common dolphin in Scotland and they actually recorded it and it actually increases its frequency to the range of porpoises when the porpoises are around. So that's just crazy in the first place. <laughs> Super cool. Um, so obviously they're, obviously they're trying to talk back probably, you know, the common dolphin's not just sitting there talking to himself. Um, and then they have shown that vocalizations that the clicks that they have, right? So they have uh, echolocation and clicks like that. They don't have, at least that we documented, whistles that are usually thought to be more communicative. Um, but they have shown that these clicks are used in a communication context, um, so not just in foraging. So it's this. So they have social structure. We just don't know what it looks like yet, and that's what we want to find out. So photo ID is critical in figuring that out, figuring out what that social structure is. Have Jaws and Comet been best friends forever? Have they never met before at all? Do they meet every once in a while? Are they? Do they just show up together when it's food time? Who knows? Um, those are the kinds of things that we can figure out by knowing the individuals and how they interact with one another. So that's what we, I hope to be able to do as we gain more and more individuals in our population. So it's not all about the food. They do have some fun. So again, that social side of things, they do play sometimes. They just may not have as much time to do it since they have to eat so much. But they do wake ride. And so this is a, a series of surfacings here. And, but they do it differently. So, you know, dolphins will generally follow the boat and they jump on the waves and they're having a great time. And we would have that in the Bahamas. We'd be driving and the, they're jumping in the wake and they're having a grand time. The, the porpoises, though, they wait for the boat to go by and then they go 
and then they wide the wake as it's kind of just settling out. So not quite the same, but they still do do it. So they, they do have some fun. Um, sometimes we see them just resting. So it's a thing called logging and um, cetaceans don't do it that often, but they will just kind of sit at the surface for five, 10 seconds and just like lounge about and then go back down and do what, go back to doing whatever they were doing. Um, here's where it's going to get uh, more graphic, but graphic in a different way than the other pictures. Um, mating is a very, ex uh, very explosive um, thing for them. The reproductive season varies by location, but here they basically give birth in August and September after about an 11, 10 to 11 month gestation. And, and then they'll nurse for about eight to 12 months. Um, we don't know the important habitats for most areas of where, where, where are they mating and where are they giving birth. We don't know that. Um, but the mating we have started to figure out. So we have seen mating attempts year round. So it is likely that they do this year round. Just, it just doesn't, it, there's a certain time frame of the year that it actually sticks. <laughs> and um, the male often leaps during this process. Now what's really interesting is talking to our colleagues in California and the awesome uh, images and stuff that they have gotten from there. Uh, but we realized what we were seeing up here when they came out of the water like this. And it's always on the left side of the female. So this is that picture that we learned about pointer, about how uh, pointer is a female. So that's pointer there. And oh, right, this is missed out. Okay, there. there's pointer. There's the male. You can see him coming up right below. He's going to explosively come out of the water. This is he is actually trying to mate right now. So it's two seconds and you can see the females turning on her belly and her flukes are kind of turning this way. And then she will, this is her fluke here, fly that way. He'll land back in the water. That's all she wrote. Blink and you miss it. Very exciting. <laughs> um, so it's a very interesting way of mating, um, being very aerial in nature. And there's the, the after, <laughs> the after splash. So here's where it's going to get a little bit more graphic. Um, males are very well endowed. And so when we saw this, like, oh, first I got this picture. And I was like, wow, I got them doing an aerial out of the water. That's so exciting. But that's when I learned when he went to California at a conference that we were actually seeing mating because you can see the males on the left-hand side, females on the right and flipping away. It has to do with their internal anatomy. Another colleague has done molds of the uh, internal organs, and it's just the way the male will fit with the female in just the right way for the best chance for the sperm to get to the egg. Um, their, their reproductive structures are very amazing. If you want, I can talk about that another time. But here again, you see the male coming on the left, the female flipping off to the right. Here's we're gonna get progressively more exciting. Again, male on the left, female on the right. He's actually flying through the air and you can see a little bit of red below his belly. Here you can see he's flipping away. He's, Jumping away, she's going to the right. Again, something's coming up from underneath his belly. Here he's very excited to see you guys. He's coming out of the water at us. Not sure where the female is on this part. The last one, this one was very exciting. I got the aerial and I was like, yes, I got the aerial. And then I zoomed in and I was like, oh my God. Okay, so there you go. That is harbor, a male harbor porpoise in full glory. Um, but they do that, they don't care. They'll fly through the air, it's not a problem. It does come all the way to their chin. So it is a it's a it's a very unique and very interesting mating strategy that we're learning more about through the pictures and through the behavior observations that we're doing and our colleagues are doing around the world. So after that excitement, that two seconds, you might end up with a baby. <laughs> and uh, again, gestation is about 11 to 12 months. They nurse for about a year. Uh, and again, first birth is every three to four. And they so um, women, those of you who have had babies. Imagine being pregnant and lactating every year for your entire lifespan, basically, once you're ready to go. It's a lot, I wish, it's a lot of work. Um, but a good way to, to notice calves is that they will be set kind of just a little bit back from the behind the dorsal fin of the female. The one on the right there or the left, depending on which way you're looking at the screen, um, is coming up and you'll see, it doesn't know how to do that really smooth roll yet. It goes, oh my God, I've got to get my blowhole out of the water. So I'm just going to stick my entire head up and then just chin slap onto the ground, onto the water. So it's called chin slap breathing. So if you see that, you know the calf is quite young. They have not figured out that smooth roll yet. 
Um, back to the dolls porpoise, uh, there we do have hybrids, and that's uh, very interesting, and they are seemingly fertile. So a lot of times hybrids will not be fertile, and that's the end of the line. But these ones, this is a pregnant hybrid dolls harbor porpoise um, that ha has a fetus inside it. So um, it's always, so far, the male harbor porpoise and the female dolls, and you can probably figure out why after what we just showed you, um, just the way their behavior is. Um, so that's something that we're looking into more. How often does this happen? Um, at, well, not us specifically, but just researchers in general. Um, we have a lot of highly scarred individuals. So by doing that photo ID, we can hopefully find out what, why. We don't know what these scars are from. Uh, and this one on the bottom is named Dodge because it looked like he dodged a bullet because he literally has punction, punction marks, scrapes, si and on both sides of the animal. Um, and so hopefully we're hoping that we can start to learn what, where these scars are coming from and to be able to help them and understand how to protect them. Um, some other research here in the Salish Sea that's happening uh, from the stranding networks is there's a, a disease called mucomycosis. Muco, muco, mycosis. It's a fungal disease started seeing in 2012, um, primarily in harbor porpoises. They did find it in an orca and, uh, and in harbor seals, um, but this could be an emerging disease that could be a problem if it becomes uh, more prevalent. Um, and then most recently, it was really interesting is they found antibiotic resistant bacteria inside the animals. And they were more likely, the porpoises were significantly more likely to have resistant organisms than seals, which is interesting because they're both coastal animals. Um, but it may be that the seals get out of the water a bunch where the porpoises are in the water all the time. So they may just be more, um, come in contact to them more. So another important thing to think about for humans as well is if they're harboring that antibiotic resistant bacteria, it can come back uh, and uh, affect us as well. So we're trying to look at this. Uh, the Salish Sea is a transboundary waterway. It, it involves Canada and the US, but a lot of times we're, they, the can Canada deals with their harbor purposes and we deal with our harbor purposes or, or, and vice versa with the different animals. But it's really important. There's no barriers. The purposes aren't like, oh, that's the Canada line. It can't cross it. They don't care. So we need to collaborate with them and make sure that we understand these guys in their biological context, not in the lines that we've marked out. So we collaborate with uh, groups from whale watching groups, stranding networks in Canada and US um, and other groups to try to understand them uh, this as, a, as a whole population. Um, we are trying to put up, we're just, we've branched into passive acoustics. So this is a really cool uh, thing that can record high frequency sounds. And our colleagues at Smelts, who are developing ropeless fishing gear to try to save whales around the world, uh, they made a rig specifically for our thing so that we could throw it out and not have to have a buoy line in the water that could possibly entangle uh, an animal. So that pink bag there will inflate when it's uh, triggered by an acoustic trigger. And there's an air tank there. And it triggers, and it just floats the whole trap up to the surface. And we can pull it out, uh, get the data out, and then put it back in the water. So we're excited to see what we learn and what we hear from this, uh, from that. We do do some boat-based surveys. We're again, we're primarily land-based, but we got a small boat donated to us, so we can't go too far on this one, but we can start to spread out and see, um, get more photos from different areas and see where these animals are going. Um, we have, if you're interested in helping us collect information, we have a citizen science uh, training, uh, and you can, so you can become a citizen scientist and go out and do your own, uh, your own observations and send in, in and adds, adds to our um, ever expanding database. So if you're interested in that, you can go to our website or you can email me. We also have a sighting app. So if you go to EpiCollect5 and download, uh, download that and look for the Harbor Porpoise, Pac-Man Harbor Porpoise, you just add that project and then you simply go through, it takes one to two minutes to uh, put down a sighting. So you add an entry, it will auto-populate the date, it'll auto-populate the time and the location. And if you're not where you were when you saw them, you can always skip those and explain at the end. And you just add how many porpoises did you see, how many calves were there, how long were you watching them, what were the environmental conditions, uh, what were they doing, were goals present, um, what was the tide if you know it, um, where you made the observation from, uh, if there were boats, were they there? What were the environmentals? Uh, if you took photos to tell me <laughs> and send them in. And then how familiar you are with, uh, if you're an expert or um, 
or not about your level of confidence of what uh, what you saw. Uh, and then we like to have people put their name because that helps us know how many people are using the app, which helps us for grants and things like that. But please share this with anybody you know that's out in the water or even hiking around. You can see these animals from the coast, from the shore, uh, and all these opportunistic sightings help us greatly in understanding better where these animals are going and what they're doing. So please share the app and use it if you can. Um, so just lastly, as I finish up right before, uh, um, we also do a lot of education. We do presentations like this, but I am a educator at heart as well. I taught high school for a while. I teach college uh, and I've given presentations anywhere from pre-K all the way up to retirement communities. So um, we, we, we want to collect that data that's needed for um, just understanding these animals and for protecting them through policies. Uh, and we also want to educate and engage everybody to learn and love these animals, love the ecosystem and what they can do to protect them. And um, so we, we try to collect uh, and conduct real life STEM experiences. So we have students that come out with us um, and do um, re mammal observations for a day. Uh, and we're working with other groups like the Sailor Sea School to provide even more of those kind of um, uh, opportunities for students. So we need your help. We need volunteers. We need sightings. We need photos. We need funding. <laughs> I will just slightly step up there for a second. Um, we are a small nonprofit, so it is very, it's, funding is just difficult to find, uh, especially competing with some of the larger organizations. So we rely on grants and um, personal and small uh, donations from people. So. Uh, if you or you, somebody you know is interested, please um, get in touch with us because <laughs> uh, we can't do the work without having having the people that, that do the work, myself and my assistant and other people that work in our organization. So uh, every little bit helps us. So that is it. We are on um, Instagram and Facebook. So if you like to hear and learn more and see cool pictures from the field, uh, please find us there. We also have a podcast as well. So you can get that on any anywhere where you get your podcasts. Uh, we have some fun episodes, um, educational episodes on that too. So uh, find us there and you feel free to email or check out the website. And thank you guys so much for coming. And I'll answer any questions if anybody has any. Okay. I think you had one here. So that's a good question. So how does the asphyxiation happen if they're breathing through their blowhole and not their mouth? So their anatomy is very interesting. Their esophagus goes from their mouth down here, but they have a separate thing that connects the blowhole to the trachea. And so it's this thing called a goose beak and they have little <laughs> monkey lips on the end of it. But this goose beak comes down and what happens is when the, I'll do it this way, when the, um, the goose beak is here, the big fish comes down and if it's big enough, it just pops it out of place. And so now that the goose beak is no longer connected to the trachea and they can't breathe. So it literally just pushes it out so they can't, can't breathe. Yeah, we don't, we, so the, there's porpoises and seals oftentimes in, at, in the past at the same time. We do not really see them interact at all. Um, occasionally they'll be in the same area, like the one where we saw the eagle, the, the seal was here, the eagle was here, there was a porpoise out of frame. So they're there together, but they're not, they don't seem bothered by each other. I think they, yeah, I think they're just like, okay, you're doing your thing, all right, we'll just, yeah. <laughs> yep, uh, there's one from Joy. Oh, right, because they can't, yes, I will, got it. Yes, they're, 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 they do this. Basically, if you have a lot of porpoises, you don't have a lot of dolls for whatever reasons. They, they overlap in what they eat, but they have a kind of a niche partitioning in that dolls are generally found in deeper water and porpoises and harbor porpoises are found in shallow water. So that's likely where they, they can co coexist. Why in particular they don't, they're not both here at the same time, we're not quite sure. Because uh, again, 
dolls porpoises, there's not that been that much research on those guys either. So uh, we have been seeing them increasing a bit more, the dolls, uh, recently. Um, so maybe there's some kind of balance where that happens, but yeah, for whatever reason, we're, we're still not sure exactly why. So the question was, is there any seasonal indication with the kleptoparasitism with the eagles taking the salmon? What's really interesting is that the paper that we're doing, we're actually connecting with uh, on the East Coast, there's uh, dolphin, bottlenose dolphins that strand feed in South Carolina. So they drive themselves up off to the beach and grab the fish. The eagles have just started doing it there too, which is really interesting. Theirs is very seasonal. They see it mainly, um, if I'm remembering correctly from the what we we're working on, um, it's fall and win like fall and winter, but here we've seen it in every single season. So it may be what we think there is that the eagles nest are nesting, they nest and the, then they the, the the fledglings leave, and then the those adults go away. They're not in that area anymore. Whereas ours here are year round, right? We have a pair that that is on Burroughs Island that has been there for years. Um, so I think it has to do with which eagles are staying in one spot versus migrating. There's different versions of that. So yeah, so here it's year round, at least that we see. It's porpoises, yeah. Porpoise is more fun. So, so we will, we'll say porpoise too, but technically it's porpoises, yeah. <laughs> No, so theirs are so small, it doesn't really happen. Um, I am not an expert on dorsal fin bending over, um, but if you think about it, that's all cartilage. So if there's something that's maybe happening inside that causes that cartilage to be less rigid, um, sometimes if they're just sitting at the surface, like, you know, the water is going to help keep that dorsal fin up as well. Um, so it doesn't really happen with the smaller animals as far as I know. Yeah, so large, uh, so the question was talking about large aggregations of porpoises in Port Susan. So that is a really great question and I'm glad you brought it up there. So they will show up in groups of like over a hundred sometimes and we still don't know why they do it or when they do it or what, you know, where they're doing it in particular. So if you have those sightings, that's something that would be great to add to that, to that app because we want to collect as many of those as possible and see if we can understand when those aggregations occur and then what's happening during them. Are they all doing mating? Um, there's one down by Stillcom. Uh, there was like 50 to 100 porpoises and we had video from a lady that sent stuff in and they were <laughs> there was four or five mating attempts. So that one was likely a uh, get together uh, party. Um, but so it's not, it is unusual to have that large of an aggregation, but it's not uncommon, right? So it happens, but it's not the norm. Um, but we're still trying to figure out why that happens. Yeah. You have a, did you have a question? Somebody had a question here? Oh. <laughs> yes. Gill nets are terrible. Yes. I mean, any net really is bad. Uh, but gill nets in particular, that's uh, for these smaller purposes like the Fakita too, that also is a big one. Um, gill nets, the size is, is just perfect for their them and they can't see it in the water really with their echolocation, so it's just the wrong, the wrong perfect fit for them. Yeah, so that, that's why having them banned is good. And that's why in Europe, they still have a lot of problems with bycatch because they do, a lot of places still do use gill nets, I believe, over there. Um, it's not as, as uh, has been, hasn't been taken away as much as it has here in the US. Is what? Well, here, like we don't use gill nets here. Um, some of the tribes, I think, are still allowed to use uh, gill nets, and some, but we basically have greatly reduced the amount of gill nets that are being used in U.S. waters in general. Um, so that's helped a lot of species. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that's the important thing to understand. Like, if we know all the biology and the and the movements and understanding how all that all works together, we can find ways to do fishing more efficiently and reduce how much other things are being caught in the process. Yeah. Yeah. 
herring, sand lance. Um, there's, yeah, yeah, basically yeah, small forage fish. A uh, hake is also a big one too. Um, those are the main ones that come to my head. There's, there's, there's like 14 or 15 different species that they'll eat, but those are kind of the bigger ones. Herring is very popular. Um, it's herring, hake, sand lance. There's another one that I can't think of right now. So exactly. So that's what we're interested in figuring out too, because we don't have a good handle on in the different areas that they're showing up. First of all, you know, we know in Burroughs Pass they are, but what are the other locations that they're there all the time for those buffets? How does that relate to what forage fish are are going there? There are quite a few um, known forage fish uh, areas where they they hatch and whatnot and grow up around the area. So, um, but it it is likely. I'm, it's they they go with the food they have to go with the food so whatever those shifts are going to be is likely what's driving them to be in certain places and at certain times so we just have to understand that better which we don't uh not grungeons i don't think it's smell if yeah, you can email me and I, I can I can give you the the list, but it's yeah, I'm completely blanking on the other one. Yeah, yeah, email me and I can give you the list of of what they are. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> wow, he's been sure I got it right. Nice. <laughs> That's good. I like. I love Ace Ventura. That's good. Oh, watch it. There you go. I forgot that that was in there. For the porpoises. Well, so that's what's interesting. We were actually wondering. Like, it's been cool that the orcas, the the bigs and transient killer whales, have been coming through our study area much more than they previously had. We've seen them twice in seven years, and this last year they were there like every week. And we're like, that's so cool. Don't eat our porpoises. Um, and also, don't create a landscape of fear, right? So if the porpoises know that that area is highly transited by uh, transients. Um, maybe they will stop coming there as much because they're, you know, that risk balance of do I go to eat or do I go to die? Uh, so that that is a very real question that we maybe hopefully be able to answer as we see how these things are changing as the animals, those orcas are coming in. Um, the one thing I'll say that I didn't mention about that is that uh, uh, the reason why uh, porpoises have high frequency, we can't hear what they're saying. And so only recently have we really been able to document that and record it with better technology. Um, but the reason why uh, we think that that evolved is because if your orcas, the, the, the orcas that are eating fish, they don't need to listen. The orcas that are eating mammals have to listen for their prey. So if you as a porpoise can pitch your sound so much higher that the orcas can't really hear it that well, then you can go on and fish yourself without worrying about the orca coming to get you. So it's likely that that happens. So they may not have to necessarily hide because they are hiding acoustically because they can't, the orcas can't hear them that well, theoretically. The, I, I don't know the exact percentage. Um, I believe it's, it generally is more seals and than porpoise, mainly because I think seals are easier to catch. But the I don't know the exact percentage number here, but the porpoise, the amount they're getting from a porpoise is it's worth the risk uh, or the, the, the energy you're putting out. So it's quite a bit higher than seals, I believe. Um, but I think it's just generally easier to eat it, to catch a seal than it is for porpoises. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I don't know what the the percentage of what the uh, the transients are eating, whether it's sea lions or seals or porpoises. Um, I think the seal lions might be a little bit. I, I think that honestly, I think the seals is probably like that perfect middle ground. <laughs> sea lions are a little bit too big and and whatever, and the porpoises are harder to catch. But I I don't know. Yeah, Joy. I want it. Can they send it to me, please? If you have that, yeah, in the comment. If you if you have that drone footage, I would love to see it. So please email me. <laughs> that would be amazing.
Welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> there is that are on the um, on the island there. If you're interested, you can grab one that has all the information on it as well. <laughs> so I want to make sure that people on here can hear me as well. So um, well, I can hear. Oh, good. <laughs> But yeah, so this is our first presentation of our four part speaker series. So if you all are interested in other presentations, um, we have a poster up here with a QR code that you can scan and sign up again for other ones on Eventbrite. Our next one is Thursday, March 24th. Um, it's going to be with Dr. Grant Hyken talking about why we have Whidbey Island, the creation, the story creation of Whidbey Island. Um, and so we don't know the location yet exactly, but you are still able to go sign up and we'll be in contact as soon as possible as we have that location determined. Um, we'll also send a follow up email and it'll have that link as well. But yeah, thanks everyone for coming out. We really appreciate it and hope you have a great rest of your night. Thank you. <laughs>